Welcome back once again to Kevin. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That's how you know we're not ready. 174. Happy 174th, everybody. They say don't comment on it because in post we can take that out. No. No, no I, I work live, man. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> mm. That is just great vodka. These people should be a sponsor. Uh, welcome back. Happy Father's Day to you, those of you that know you're a father. Uh, I, um, my, uh, my dad, uh, left this planet maybe 12 years ago, I want to say. Could be 18. What is he, Poochie the dog? He went yes. back to his home planet? <laughs> he went back to his home planet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, because Superman opened this weekend, it reminded me when my dad went back to the home planet. And, uh, it was a, it was a strange, uh, strange send-off. Sorry, I made a Simpsons reference. Because he was, that's odd that you made, that you turned my father's death into a Simpsons reference. <laughs> none, of, well, none of our fans will appreciate I that. I didn't know it was a death until you just said so. You made it sound like he went to a different planet. <laughs> no, he did go to a different planet. So he's dead to me. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I had the uh, silent but deadly father. I don't mean to suggest that he was farting all the time. I just meant the man didn't have much to say. When he did, it could kill you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but just, uh, I was very fortunate. I had a good dad. I had a really good dad. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to think today, uh, maybe if there was a, a, a list of reasons why I decided not to be a father. And I could not blame my own father. Yeah. Did Edie wish you a happy Father's Day? I got uh, the same gift I get every year from Edie, our cat, which is um, uh, uh, two peas and a poop. <laughs> You haven't even seen her yet today. <laughs> I, I can make an assumption based on averages. <laughs> there's two peas and a poop waiting for me in the uh, box. I bet you Maybe there's somebody already extra. cleaned it. <laughs> I bet you there's something extra in there today for Bob. <laughs> <laughs> or, or in the fireplace. That would be awesome. Two peas of poop and a cupcake. <laughs> Did we tell you that our cat took to using the downstairs fireplace as a downstairs shitter? <laughs> Well, I've seen that fireplace. <laughs> <It's not wrong. laughs> well, there are two, not to brag. Um, the living room fireplace. The, the I formal see. living yeah. room. Yeah. <laughs> not to brag. Their houses were 17 fireplaces. <laughs> and I just tried not to brag that we have two. Um, yeah, so one of them was the downstairs shitter for the cat. Because we, we got the fake. I like the gas. I don't like, well, you know, the Jews. They don't, can't really work wood. So I got the fake wood in there with the gas pipes. But then we got special with the filler at the bottom. So it looked like there had been fires previously. Yeah. And ashes had been gathered. Yeah. Very schmancy. Yeah. Overpaid for that. So the cat thought, that looks like a litter box to me. And then, so I would see like the stuff kicked out onto the tile and think, huh, she must have been in there playing. And then, and then I got a whiff one day and thought, oh no. So I thought I would clean it up and I cleaned it up after her maybe a half dozen times over the course of a couple of months before I realized well, she's six years old. It's difficult to train a six-year-old cat, let alone any cat of any mm. age. So I thought, I got to take all that expensive crap out of We're spending way too much time on this. You think? Move on. I, Move really? On. Yeah, I was going to ask, this your new opener? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought this was the most fascinating thing I've ever said on the show. Yeah. Um, I had never seen a cat turn a downstairs fireplace into a shitter. I guess that really was the, the beginning and end of it all. So my Father's Day uh, uh, memories are, are that. And I hope you're <laughs> celebrating yours in a much happier way. Sammy, did you call uh, your Harris. father? I, Harris of today? Of course, <laughs> I called Dr. Harris J. Levine, DDS, mm -hmm. of course, as I do on every Father's Day. And did you thank him? I did. I thanked him for knocking my mom up right. 32 mm -hmm. years ago. Right. Job well done. Right, because you were on and here purpose. here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Planned Parenthood. Weren't we all? Sure. Yeah. Well. Uh, but uh, but uh -huh. it was it was a great Father's Day for him. He's golfing. Is he? It's all he wants to do in life is golf. Is that right? So he's out on the links. I didn't know Harris was a golfer. Oh yeah, big time. Well, settle down. I'm a real disappointment to him. Easy. Cannot connect with the ball. No. No. Uh, great at racquetball though. I seem to remember. Uh, more of a badminton guy. Are you? Yeah. Uh, just Jamie? because I like saying shuttlecock. Uh, well, I wish you'd say it just once more and then never again. Shuttlecock? Thank you. Never again. Jamie, have you talked to uh, mostly sober Jim Fox today? Yes, I did. And how was he? He um, was very disappointed that I was the only person that sent him anything or called, and then he told me I'm his favorite. Wow. <laughs> and now the rest of the family knows that, as they never miss a show. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sammy, I also, yes, in please. honor of Father's Day, watched the first segment of Creepshow, Father's Day. 
starring a very young Ed Harris. A very young Ed Harris. <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. That's all you got? But that is how you celebrate it? Yes. You made a point of... I had some time to cut. I was like, I'm going to take 15 minutes out and uh, watch the first segment of Creep Show. It's that kind of thoughtfulness <laughs> that brings you the fans that it does. Sammy, you were just in uh, Chicago. The Windy City. That a lot of people think is your homeland, but in fact it isn't. Oh, in a sorts. I mean, I was born there and spent a lot of time there as a kid, but technically I was not raised there. No, no. Yeah. So it was nice to go back to the Windy City this time of year. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I got very lucky with the weather. Got to see four Cubs games in four days. And they won how many of them? One out of four, they won just one as out of... I expected. All right. But it was a very exciting win. Uh, they won it in uh, the bottom of the 14th inning. Mr. 250, I uh, think, was the... Yeah. First name of the team. I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never seen an extra innings win like that uh, so deep into the game. I've never seen a, the Cubs walk off win because I always see them when they're on the road. And a walk off loss is usually. Typically, yeah. their, their MO. So, with the extra innings, did you, does that mean you had a second dog? Uh, I had, uh, I think, four hot dogs that day, but I didn't get two seventh inning stretches. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm not good with so math. I'm sure out. that makes sense to somebody. I worked it out. No Harold Ramis sightings? There were no Harold Ramis sightings. Uh, I thought I saw John Cusack, but it turned out to just be an old... <laughs> I couldn't even finish the joke. No, you really so couldn't. Stupid. You bailed on your so own joke. Stupid. That was horrible. It was so stupid. <laughs> I wish I really am sorry I miss your stand-up days because this, this, this really no, no, no. was those those were, those were painfully scripted. And the audience just would stare at Sam, thinking he knows why this is funny. It's not even a joke. Okay. Oh, it was a joke. suffice to say it was not John Cusack. It's a great trip, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. good to hear it. Hey, Jamie. Only two episodes left of the of the Mad Men. Therefore, the podcast uh, yes. Mad Men. You watch it. Well, we'll New do three. What we do a a final recap. Yes. New and noteworthy on the iTunes. Check it out, but folks. But by the time this episode airs, it'll be on <laughs> <laughs> Uh Right. For the 13 of you watching live, this is great news. Uh, now part of the Airwolf uh, Podcast Network. Speaking of the, um, the drop time slot, those of you that were wildly used to us being on uh, every week, a day or so after the live, have tried to get used to the uh, every other week that we've been dropping on Airwolf. And based on your emails, I'm doing my best to change that. Uh, going back to the weekly, I'll, I'll keep you posted, and I appreciate your patience on that. I, I was a little lazy thinking, every other week is great, because then I could miss a weekend here and there. And uh, boy, are you pissed. So uh, settle down, A, B, I'm with you. Um, watching us live on YouTube, um, let us know what you think. Write to us at contact at com. for example. Do you want to take a shot at the Larry King game that you've seen our guests do every week? We'll send you a damn t-shirt, like the one that's in our gift, gift, gift bag. Uh, Kevin Pollock's Chat Show t-shirt. Yeah, just send us the Larry King game. If I use it, I'll send you a shirt. Also tell us how you watch the show, how you listen. What, how do you do KPCS? David wrote to us. Wow. He writes... Someone wrote? Thanks for the fantastic Barry Sonnenfeld interview. I used to watch the show on my second monitor while I did extraordinarily boring graphics work at an office. I am now freelancing at my own studio with limited internet, so I listened to you having previously downloaded the MP3 via Earwolf. Wow. There you have it. I don't know. I'm still dubious that any of our, our fans are literate. I don't, know, I don't know that he wrote that. Uh-huh. Let's see if you can finish that joke now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Here, here's my Larry King. David's pressing his bet. Here's my Larry Ki King, if you, uh, you may take or leave. Using your thumb to carefully poke the head of your penis deep into the shaft is not only possible, but meditative. <laughs> Unfortunately, I perform this activity in the company of William Conrad. <laughs> there's more to this. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's, but I think it's over right there. That's, there's, that's it. It did in the company. That should have been the edit? punch. Give him a friendly edit. Just go to the phones. Now, yeah. roll forward. Scroll forward, Kenny, so I can go to the phones now and save this kid some trouble. I'm... Pancake West Virginia. Hello. All right. You thank go. you, David, for those uh, wonderful uh, How You Do KPCS and your Larry King game. A T-shirt coming your way. I'm going to need another email from you at contact at kevinpollockschatcher.com. Tell me your shirt size. And your address, <clears throat> that's how I do it. I give away t-shirts and I collect emails and addresses. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
My guest today is a, uh, a, while we've been talking about him and kind of building this up every week when I go through the list of upcoming guests, <clears throat> last week we had the Michael C. Hall for the Dexter fans, and um, upcoming we've got uh, Mitch Hurwitz, creator, showrunner of um, Rested Development, Brian Fuller, creator, showrunner of Hannibal, Bonnie Hunt, the always delightful, speaking of Chicago. Next week, Freddie W., internet filmmaker, also known as Freddie Wong, for those of you listening and watching us from Asia. <laughs> I never get tired of that buffer gang. I really don't. It's my favorite thing in life. And I don't care that 80% of our audience listens right. to the show and has never seen it. No, you just like it to keep our, our booth guys on, on their toes. Yeah. We've not had a guest uh, born or raised in Nahant, Massachusetts. We do now. Please welcome Jason Mansukas. Hello, sir. How are you, sir? Did I pronounce that correctly? The Nanhant? Nahant. Oh, sure. Very close, though. <laughs> Very close. I had a couple choices. Yeah. I chose. And you chose. And I, you know, I like that you went, took a choice. Yeah. And then you went with it like I committed. confidently. Yeah, yeah. I, really, I did. Oh, yeah. I didn't hedge until oh, afterwards. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, what was like life at Nahant? What was like life? Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> and here we go. I shouldn't have had all those drinks on the plane. Uh, thank you, everyone in Seattle. It was a great weekend. Um, life was, um, Nahant is a... Bucolic? It is. It's like, it is. It's a very kind of Norman Rockwellian kind of old-timey New England. It's, a, it's an island off the coast of Massachusetts that is connected by a two-lane, um, like, bridge basically like a causeway a man-made causeway so right. it's super isolated um but in, in in as such like very kind of like old-timey beautiful old new england town wow tiny i think it's the smallest town it's one square mile uh so it's just uh You're kidding yeah, me. i think it's the smallest town in massachusetts I what think. year were the nahant murders Oh, oh, all of the, you mean the Nahant Massacre? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, that is ongoing. <laughs> it is ongoing. Well, it, when you're on a mile stretch. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. Someone's going to die almost oh, every yeah, day. Yeah. No, no, there, there is a cleansing <laughs> once a year because the population can't get too big. No. It is an island yeah. uh, that is one square mile. That's so right. as the population grows, there needs to be a purging. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a subtle vi a viral marketing campaign for the, t the new feature film, The Purge. <laughs> <laughs> right. Unbeknownst to you, it was actually it's a movie about population control. Yep. <laughs> it's not. It's, oh, yeah, that's yeah. all it really is. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, how so early uh, in your life there, as well as your like, um, did you decide, I've got to get off this island? Like, super quick. <laughs> super quick. I was like, and, I, and it's the kind of place that now when I go back there, my parents still live there, now when I go back there, it is the loveliest place to go back to. Sure. Like, so beautiful and so lovely. But as a kid, as a kid, it was nice to be there. But the minute I was like, like a teenager, basically, I was like, "Get me the fuck <laughs> out of here!" Right. You know, like there because even, <clears throat> like even in order to like hang out with friends or anything, uh, there weren't a lot of kids. Like I, I, went, I got bused to a different town to go to school. So like to see people, I would have to like ride my bike like an hour. Oh, no, just to hang out with people. Oh no, it was terrible. Yeah. Um. Uh. But but you know, these are the this is the crucible any, I was formed. In. Sure, sure, I understand. Were there any schools at all on the? There was like an elementary school. I went to elementary school, and then for the rest of schooling, was bused two towns over. Two towns over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was an argument with the first town. There was. <laughs> there was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the kids had gone to school. What did they call the people of Nahant? Were the Islanders? What did they, they no, have? A we nickname? Did, I didn't know that there was any kind of nickname any for it. Any hate-filled vernacular? No, there wasn't. No? There wasn't. It, uh, that's funny. Yeah, no, there wasn't any kind of derogatory that you know term. Of. Uh, yeah, but there was like the town. I do remember. Like that, we were when we were bused to this other town. We were perceived of as the bad kids. Sure. Like, like we went to a kind of Tony New England town. Did you? Uh, you know, to to high school, uh, to junior high and high school. Right. And it was very evident that like the kind of rough and tumble Nahant kids were like definitely like they are trash. Running wild. Like we are. Yeah, they are the bad kids. Uh, but we were, as far as I'm concerned, the heart and soul of every place we ever went. Right. So yeah, I'm picturing Lord of the Flies. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just a just a a gauntlet of uh, of harrowing experiences. Yeah. Yep. Uh, siblings. Younger sister. 
Uh huh. Three and a half years my junior. Oh, so there was a protective bond. Of course, of always, you. always. It lasts to this day. To course. this day, yeah. I will take a bullet for her, <laughs> right. and I will shoot anybody that threatens her. <laughs> right. Um, she lives in Maine now with two amazing daughters, one of whom it's her birthday today, so happy birthday, Matea, although she's not watching. I interesting that um, she's Wrong born. Assumption. She's, yeah, slightly. She's not a fan. No, oh. no, I, I know she's not a fan. Oh, that's fine. Then. She, um, she's ten, mine? I believe ten years. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, of yours. She found the show on her own. She's ten years old, nine years old. Uh, found the show on her own and was like, you know, Uncle Jason, what I don't care for is the Kevin Pollock chat show. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't like it. You know what? <laughs> Discerning taste at age nine yeah, yeah, yeah. is one of the most impressive things you could ask yeah. for in a child. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Uh, speaking of odd birthdays, hers being on Father's Day. Yep. Uh, how much fun... This year it's on Father's Day. <laughs> exactly. As, as you know. <laughs> I know it rotates. Her birthday will change every every year. It's yeah. not, She wasn't born on the Sunday. <laughs> You've been listening to her too much. I'm not as stupid <laughs> as she says I am. <laughs> <laughs> this year, she got to celebrate with fathers. You, on the other hand, one week exactly before Christmas, every fucking year was your birthday. Oh, yes. So how much fun was that? It was, um, I might Because I hear from whiners yeah. between Christmas and New Year's or the day before sure. or something. So a week before. A week before. My parents were very good about being, about celebrating my birthday as if it was just my birthday. There was, I didn't get a combined present. I always had a birthday party. They were very good about, like, your birthday is not going to get just kind of swallowed into Christmas. Greatest parents alive. Pretty much. Bill yeah. and Cindy Manzook is killing it, guys. <laughs> they don't watch either. They don't watch. No. They don't. I tried to get them into it because I like the show. I tried to get them into it. They do not care for me. Um, not our cup of tea. No, no, no. no. And my, my dad also has a lot of notes on a lot of your acting work. <laughs> um, no, so yeah, they, they were very good about it. They were like very... Uh, you know, Aware. conscientious yeah. of the fact that that could be the the case, and you know, every year, birthday party, blah blah blah, and then Christmas. Great, loved it. Wow. So December easily your favorite month. Needless. December, pretty great month. Needless. I feel good about December usually. <laughs> yeah. Birthday, then Christmas, and then New Year's. Uh, but then it is like a, it's a long it's a long eleven months until I get to celebrate anything. <laughs> You're right. Uh, worst birthday. Ooh, worst birthday. Come on now. Trying to think. I'm sure I can come up with one. I don't know. Hmm. I can't think of a good worst birthday. I mean, I'm sure there were like years, teen years that were frustrating and, and sad birthdays, but I can't remember any of them. Right. Well, I have blocked them out. You've clearly blocked them out because we happen to have one of them on video. Oh, God. We roll the. Uh, oh, God. Um, uh, who got it's just you? me punching a dog in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Not just any dog, and that's why it's funny. Um, how did you uh, stumble across uh, Stephen Wright? Were you just aware as a kid of, because you were pretty young when he was on the scene, no? Stephen Wright, oh yeah, but Stephen Wright was a Boston comedian. Yeah, so like, yeah. as a as a com as a kid who loved comedy. But you weren't going to the... No, no, no. I was too young. To the ding ho. No, but, but, you know, like, I was aware of... The Boston Cup, Jimmy Tingle, all these guys that were the Boston comedians, you know, and because they would be on the radio or they would blah blah blah. And then when they started putting out records, right. I would get all those. I would buy all those records, Lenny you know. Clark. Yeah, and so like you know, I was the kid who was whatever, thirteen years old, mowing the lawn, listening to Stephen Wright records, you know, like that would like we, on my Walkman. That that's or or I mean or any comedy record. I listened. I had Bill Cosby record, everything. But I in particular Stephen Wright for whatever. I think because he seemed like. I had allegiance to a Boston guy. He was across the bridge. Yeah, and then and then I did. I went to a movie once in Boston as I, when I was older, and they made probably in like high school or whatever. Uh, I went to a movie in Boston, and Stephen Wright was in the movie theater, and I was like, "This is amazing! <laughs> this is crazy! You guys, Stephen Wright is over there." And he was alone, and I was like, "I gotta go talk to him," and I I didn't. I was too terrified. Yeah. But like to me, that was like a huge person. He would have loved if you had gone over. <laughs> Probably. Alone. Let's 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 do that moment now. Sure, we? sure. sure. You're so Steve, you can you're Stephen Wright. I'm gonna go ahead and try. <clears throat> I've never done them before. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Mr. Wright. Oh yeah. Uh, just so so sorry to bother you. I know we're here waiting on this movie, but <clears throat> I just want to say like I'm a huge fan. <clears throat> For so many years, like you know, I've been following your career and your oh, yeah. Tonight Show appearances. I just I just want to say thanks. Like, you know, really great stuff. Okay, thanks. Thank you. 
Would that have been disappointing for you? <laughs> if that's all you got? You know what? Because I've spent time with Steven. From what, from what I imagined it to be, that was better than what, that was better. And kind of now, like, fills a hole that was Yeah, in my oh, good. Heart. Well, that's what I was hoping like, for. Like, you have succeeded. I was hoping, well, I, I love him to death, and, and um, I spent a little bit of time with him 100 years ago back when I would come through Boston to do yeah. stand up, and, and if he was around. At a place called the Ding Ho. Sure. It was a regular uh, and a ridiculous name for a club. Um, but yeah, no, he was uh, uh, just so cool and, and crazy smart. And then I loved the, the movie that he um, wrote. And, and I never saw that. Wow. It, the way he won an Oscar. Of, appointments right? of Dennis Jennings and won an Oscar for Best Show. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dean Pearsall, who I think just directed some big movie that's about to come out. Hey, I'll look it up. Somebody, somebody there was a somebody, way. Somebody look if it only up. there was a way to learn information. If only there was, right? Very quickly. What, what did we do back Ugh. then? Uh, and uh, also influences from uh, Kids in the Hall. I'm going to ask if you have a favorite Kids in the Hall sketch. We have a, uh, a bit of a Kids in the Hall uh, aficionado here in the oh, room. Oh, then I'm, then I'm sure. Uh, we, in, in Jamie or Sam? back or play, but yeah. 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 Well, we both pretty. Are, though. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite Kids in the Hall sketch. I mean, for me, like, growing up, there were, there would be those kind of revelatory things that you would discover. Like, now I feel like probably with the internet, anybody can, if you have an interest in sketch comedy, you can just pull down everything from yeah. your show of shows to the state to Kids in the Hall to every, you know, you can run the gambit. At When I was growing up, there was really just something you would catch, something would happen. In my, in my case, it was PBS started rerunning Monty, Monty Python. Python. yeah. And that for me was like, whoa, whoa, wait, what's happening? Wait, how do, wait everybody hang on a second. <laughs> Something's going on here and we all need to like recognize this. Yeah. And then Kids in the Hall started playing like, like in prime time. Like that to me yes. was huge, you know, like a, not contemporary, because they were certainly older than me, but they felt like, oh, this is, this is for our generation. Right. And so like, and also like those things that kind of seemed kind of, I don't know. Once I understood the games of sketch comedy, I always enjoyed things that broke those games. Yeah. And I felt like Kids in the Hall loved breaking those rules and breaking those games. Um, and so like everything, all those things, right. you know, like even just like the simplest games of I'm crushing your head, yeah. you know, like that's a great sketch and that's so stupid. And simple. It's so simple and so stupid. And then years later, I remember another one that really, I really remember being like, oh, wait a minute. It was, um, was the Dana Carvey show sketch that is Carell and Colbert, yeah. and it's waiters who are made nauseous by food, is yes. the name of the sketch. Mm -hmm. And it is the simplest game you can do. It is just two waiters trying to explain the specials of the day <laughs> to patrons, and it's always just, so uh, we have a char-grilled Atlantic, uh, <laughs> Atlantic salmon. <laughs> <laughs> It's pantsy, you know, and it's just trying to get through the list of specials, and it's just more and more, and it's Colbert is delivering it, and Carell just is getting behind him, getting more and more like, like just retching, and it is. I remember watching this and crying, laughing, and my parents being like, yeah, oh yeah, my parents being like. We, we see what, but we don't think this is that funny. <laughs> but I that's I watched that sketch, and then the other one that I remember being like, "Oh wait, you can do this too." Is the Mr. Show Thimble sketch? Yeah, which is another one that is like, "Oh, so you're just so wait the discovery of oh you're just gonna do this? <laughs> right? We're only doing this for seven minutes? <laughs> right? Great. Yeah, I'll I'll watch this forever. Yeah, I love you know like so there are those kind of moments or those kind of revelations that you, those discoveries that I feel like you, when, like right when I felt like I understood what I, what I thought sketches to be or what I thought, it was the same thing too, like I thought improv was short form, was right. like games, like they would do on, who, like they also used to play the, 
British Whose Line Is It Anyway right. on TV. And I watched that and I was like, oh, that's great, and blah, blah, blah. And then the first time I saw people do long form improv, just like one suggestion and then they're gonna do a whole show on that. Yeah. I remember just being like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Yeah. You can do this? Right. You know, uh, and, and that kind of allowing for a whole new avenue of discovery. Yeah, somebody brought, um, you were doing, according to the dossier, <laughs> Comedy in uh, in high school and then starting in college, and somebody brought a copy of uh, Truth and Comedy. Oh yeah, yeah, and it kind of changed everything. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Like it was Rodney Rothman, who is uh, who at the time we who we went to college with, and then became head writer at Letterman, and now is a, a you know a big writer producer here. He went for a summer in between semesters at school, went and interned at. Chicago City Limits, I think, yeah. in New York. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good. Yeah. And he brought back this book that was that's like the kind of improv Olympic manual for improv Olympic being the improv theater based out of Chicago that Del Close, Del Close uh, and Sharna Halpern yeah. kind of like founded, and a lot of what you would think of as like the Upright Citizens Brigade theater come out of the Upright Citizens Brigade rather come out of that. A lot of a lot of people come out of that scene. Um, and this is a book that, that was the kind of teachings of Del Close and the the template of the Herald. You the, know, Herald the Herald, yeah. The Herald being the, the kind of base level improv form that everybody learns and that all people, that, that in that school and then subsequently at, at UCB as well, that everybody kind of learns and is like the kind of loose structure that everybody improvises within and then kind of deconstructs and takes apart and then once you figure it out you kind of leave it behind but that is the kind of transitional element because if you tell people who are going to step on stage uh you have there are no there is nothing there is nothing in front of you but somebody's going to say one thing and then you're responsible for like 35 minutes of content go People will lose their minds. Right. You will watch people like implode. Right. Because that is, it's just, if you say that, everything is possible. And so people don't know what the fuck to do. Right. But if you say, like, okay, so that's what's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna give you a suggestion. And then there, here are, here are the, here's a loose skeleton that you can pursue. Here right. is all you know, you know, you need to first do this opening exercise that gets a bunch of ideas out, then a series of two person scenes, then pop, 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 pop. That's the Herald. That's the Herald. The skeleton. Recurring, yeah, it's like a very loose skeleton. Um, but it allows for you to pursue, uh, it allows for you to drive towards something. Okay, I know now at the end of this scene is another two-person scene, and then another two-person scene, and then we're going to do a group game. So I, I, I know how to keep moving forward. Anyway, so this is all kind of broken down in this book, and we all like devoured this book, and we're like, blah, blah, blah. And the, the Herald lasts about half an hour. Right. You know, 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Top to bottom, uh, but we didn't know that. So we read the whole thing, and it gives examples in the Herald. And so then we were like, "Okay, we're gonna do this." This was our. We were like, we were a short form group. We were a games group, you right. know. Uh, but we read this, and we were like, "Fuck!" And this is awesome. This is like next level. We're gonna be crazy. And you're how old? You're. Uh, I mean, nineteen. Right. I mean, we we're like you know uh, sophomores, juniors in college. And uh, so we got a gig at the coffee shop on campus because we normally performed at like the student center for a lot of people, but we were going to try this out, so we did it at the coffee shop, and it lasted an hour and a half. Sure, it did. <laughs> it lasted an hour and a half, and people were like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> what? And we it was because the of the beginning of the Herald is like, say you get a suggestion. So what's the suggestion? Uh, cottage cheese and fruit. Cottage cheese and fruit. Thank you so much. So then what you do is you do like, you just explode that idea, right? So, so it's like people start doing like breakfast, healthy, but people just start populating this with ideas, like little lines of dialogue, whatever. It's meant to last like a minute, a minute or two. Instead, it lasts Just a, 15 minutes. 15 <laughs> minutes of word association. Like people paid money to come, sit, have a drink, and watch us be like breakfast, breakfast cereals, conchocula, uh, blueberry. Uh, Lucky Charms, uh, Rainbow, uh, Gay Rights, Stonewall, uh, Stonewall Jackson, the Jackson Five, uh, Five Alive, uh, Sunny D. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes of this insanity. Five. Right, like, 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 just verbal diarrhea. And then, and you guys that, are probably getting high. Oh, we're like, we're, <laughs> we're in it. We're in it. We're like so excited. And then we bust into two-person scenes, and those are epically long. <laughs> it was. I wish. I wish somebody had video it. Only because it would be. They had cell phones back then. Oh, the worst thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and we did that for so. long. And then somebody. I remember somebody came in and was like, "Hey, 
I just found out, I think Rodney maybe, Rodney maybe had talked to somebody from New York, I was like, I just found out this is supposed to take half as long as we're doing. <laughs> and we were all like, oh no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Those terrible. Those poor people. Let's find poor, them. terrible people. And get them their stuff back. Do that. <laughs> Are you side noting over there or side barring? I'm looking to, I, the Five Alive reference killed me and I'm looking to see if they still make it. Five Alive? Yeah. Because <laughs> that was something that my, um, I had a great aunt growing up and she was diabetic and she always, I was like, what is this Five Alive? And like, that's what my, like, that's my, um, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super, all, a lot of my references are from uh, are diabetics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote the book on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the only yeah, time no, I've ever seen I've, it. Well, I do, please, and do, it's on Amazon, all yeah. of my book about diabetic jokes. Yeah. <laughs> it's Diabetes and Them, I think is the name of it. I do think you should do a, a thing on the show right now, which okay. is that people should write in yes. and finish Sam's unfinished joke. <laughs> I thought yes. I saw, here it is, I thought I saw John Cusack, <laughs> but it turns out it was a blank. <laughs> yes, yes. If you want to win a t-shirt, one Please of you will be selected. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, whoever's watching, write into the uh, chat room. Jamie, you're going to have to uh, devour these and forward it. Okay, I thought I saw John Cusack, but it turns out it was... Blank. But it was just a blank. Yeah, it was just a blank. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put mine in now. So, okay. So please don't send this in. <laughs> a pile of old dirty coats. <laughs> coats? I thought I saw John Cusack, and it was a pile of old dirty coats. <laughs> That's actually quite good. It's pretty good. Yeah. This would make a really good um, Cards Against Humanity. It would. <laughs> that would be a great Cards Against Humanity. I don't even know what that is. It's a, a, a improv it's a game, that, a card game that you uh, play at parties. It's that, a very oh. similar to Apples to Apples. Oh, I'm familiar with yeah. that. There you go. Got it. Uh, okay, so you're you're uh, devouring the world of improv, and uh, somehow decide, you know what? I need to spend a couple of years studying ethno, ethno musicology yeah. in North Africa and the Middle East. Correct, yes. Because I've had a lot of fun, mm -hmm. and now I need to do something that now doesn't need... sound fun at all. Yeah, well, it sounded, <laughs> it did seem fun to me. Uh -huh. I was, it was, at the concurrent to me, like being very into comedy and very kind of like uh, pursuing a lot of that, I was also, Aggressively uh, 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 into, I was a drummer. I was very, like that was to me in my kind of youthful mind. I was like, I'm going to be a musician. Right. I played drums. I was in bands. I was obsessed with that. I, I like, I, I grew up outside Boston. And I took classes at like Berkeley and the New England Conservatory. And I was like really like Holy crap. a nerdy music kid. So in my mind, I was like, I'm going to be a jazz drummer. That's my, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, Some of the greatest careers I think we've ever read Oh my God, read and we can all look now at all of the famous jazz drummers. Let's start with... Uh, Tony Williams, uh -huh. Elvin Jones. <laughs> Elvin Jones, great one. Oh my God, oh, uh, are you kidding? Max Roach. Max Roach. Oh, everybody, Where household names, all of them. <laughs> um, so for me, I was like, I was very into music and I, I like I, uh, for, in college, I was a, like a legitimately terrible student. Like I, I wrote a thesis that uh, when I, I wrote a thesis for for honors to graduate with honors, which I did not graduate with honors because my thesis defense began with my uh, my advisor saying to me, uh, "Well, Jason, uh, you're not a great scholar." Wow! <laughs> and I was like, I was like, Larry, I can't disagree <laughs> because I had just for like three weeks been like, "Oh shit, I got to write a thesis." Okay, here you go. <laughs> like I wrote it all. I didn't check it. I didn't proof it. I didn't do anything. I just handed it in. Wow. And then they were basically like, so this is garbage. Yeah. So we're not going to let you graduate with honors. We're still going to let you graduate. We love you. You're great. <laughs> You're hilarious. You're hilarious. But yeah. he, he was like, he's the same professor who was the greatest, who uh, he taught a, I was a religion major. So he taught a like two and a half hour Old Testament class. And uh, he, at one point, he was like, hey, Jason, will you walk back to my office with me? And I was like, sure, Larry. And, he, and we start walking back, and he goes, so I feel like, and I thought, I was like, maybe I'm in trouble. Or blah, blah. And he said, I feel like at about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes into the class, I lose everybody. <laughs> what are some things I could do to like bring people 
into the class, to bring people into the discussion, to like get them back. So he was asking me like performance notes on his performance, and it was, and I was, I was like obsessed with it. I was like, oh great, let's do this. Yeah. So like, so then it was, became like, how do we poo poo like monkey with this thing wow. to make it so that it, people feel engaged and change it up, and so it's not just like constant monologuing. Right. Um, so my thesis defense was basically like, you're a terrible student. I love you. So what are you going to do next? Yeah. You know. And I was like, well, I'm at the time I was choosing between uh, I was auditioning and getting called back for the Blue Man Group in New York. Sure you were. And I had applied for this grant to do uh, a project abroad, uh, which was like, which is it's called a Watson grant. It's a it's basically a non academic Fulbright. And so I proposed a project that was I wanted to study. Music, jazz music, and like um, uh, it was the project as it existed was I want to go to these countries, North Africa and the Middle East, and I want to study music that is meant to bring about some sort of union with God. So, like, musics that put people in trances, musics that people use in healing ceremonies that are supposed to like bring people in connection with the divine. Are you and your uh, fellow students of this music behind the crap that plays at the massage place? <laughs> no. Okay. Thank God, no. Yeah, because I've seen God a couple times. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's just from hand jobs, right? <laughs> Feet jobs, actually. I'm not sure which <laughs> yeah. massage place you're going to. <laughs> but if, it, if it's the one that just plays techno while you got a hand job, you know, there's an I app. have nothing to do with you that. You know there's an app now? Oh, for, for, it's, do you know that Sal Governale from the Howard Stern Show is behind this app? No. For finding massage parlors, they jerk you off? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Sal, a stockbroker from the Howard Stern Show, is one of the people behind that app. Oh, well, that makes sense. That's how I know about yeah, it, because yeah. he always is talking about it. Um, <laughs> anyway, so so I get this grant, um, and then I, and it basically is, and in my mind, I was really like, this is cool, I'm gonna go live abroad, blah, 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 this is awesome. Yeah. And then I got it, and the only requirement was, they'll give you a bunch of money, you have to live outside the United States for a year. You have to, you can't come back, you can't go back and forth. Can't come see your family. You can't come back for holidays. You're gone for a year. Seems a little. Well, that's it. But they're like, but we're going to give you all this money. You don't have to. You don't have to do anything. There's no. There's no curriculum. There's no advisors. There's come nothing. It's with... just free money. Wow. Come back with an experience, because that's their whole thing. Is their their whole thing is like full. There are Fulbrights and there are other scholarships that will pay you to do something academic that you want to pursue. We right. want to pay you to do something that you otherwise would never be able to do. Wow. Um, so they fund all these crazy projects. And so uh, I flew to Morocco, sure. landed, and had a stone cold nervous breakdown. Because I was like, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done? I don't know anybody. I don't know, I don't speak any of these languages. I don't have a single person to talk to. I, and I literally had a nervous breakdown. It sounds like you prepared the same way you did for your thesis. Oh, not at all. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I was completely ill-prepared. Got there and it was a, a disaster for maybe like three weeks. Had you even arranged for? Uh... Nothing. Had I even arranged for it? No, I can tell you now, no. <laughs> whatever the answer, whatever the question was, no. Dinner. Nope. <laughs> Place nope. to stay. No, nothing. I'd arranged for zero. What? I got there and was and, and was furiously looking through like a travel book. And like went to a cheap hotel and just like began like openly weeping. Because I was like, I can't go home for a year. I was like, there's no way I can do this. It's a prison sentence. Oh, yeah. And then days would go by and I wouldn't talk to another person. <laughs> and I was just like, when am I ever going to talk to anybody again? <laughs> I, I, do I even exist? Like, like I was. Remember was, when I was funny? Yeah, it was crippling. And, and, and it really was like, it's a very kind of like, um, it's a very huge like, like moment in my life where I, where it really is for me the period of my life where I become self-sufficient. Yeah. Like, I, like I become an adult, you know, right. and I'm like, oh no, I find a group of people, blah, 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 and this leads to that, and suddenly I'm How done. long before your logic mind stepped in and cut, like three weeks. cut off the emotional side? Yeah, like two, three weeks. Uh, wow. Like I was, like for a week I was in Rabat uh, in Morocco, which was, a weirdly kind of administrative city, and I couldn't kind of get a bearing on it. And so then I kind of then I went to this other town, which was a little more touristy. What year are we talking about? This is 1996. So, okay. 1996. Uh, f 
I'm trying to think how, how computer okay. savvy you are at this point. And Almost. Oh, I have just gotten an email address. <laughs> right. I have just, and there are, the, and I'm in Morocco. <laughs> yes. I don't. I'm not carrying a There's computer. There's no internet cafes yet. There is. <laughs> really. Once I get to uh, Marrakesh, which I, where, which is where I wind up living for seven months, there is an internet cafe. I find one in Marrakesh, and so one of my every other day r rituals is I will walk the two miles or whatever to this internet cafe and I will email the two people that I know that have email. Right, of course. And that's it. And you would write them 1,700 page letters. Oh, like, <laughs> like hilarious. Right, I wish but, we could keep a record of the first oh, yeah. batch of emails we sent. I, if nobody I, knew what the fuck they were oh, doing. Oh no, just chaos. Yeah, just, are you getting this? Yeah, what is, what's going on? <laughs> I miss you, how is everything? Tell me everything. Well, yeah. this is what's happening with me. Yeah. Brrr. Like, like crazy. Like letters from the front in the Civil War were yeah. more sophisticated. That's than. what it'll, it'll be Ken Burns documentaries <laughs> right. that are like zooming in on computer monitors <laughs> right. instead of old letters. Right, as the letters slowly click out in green and gray. Exactly. Uh, so, wow. So, yeah, so they, I did that they, for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, so the deal was you can't come back for a year. You yeah. end up staying a couple of years. I stayed two. Once I you stayed found, just under two. Once you found your groove. Yeah, once I, once I kind of figured it out. Um, we're, we're still pursuing the music. Yeah, yes, but also at this point just pursuing the experience. Right. Also, you know, like the, the project itself was kind of malleable in the sense of like, Sometimes I would find stuff, sometimes I wouldn't. Like there it was like you knew nobody was waiting for a report. Exactly. And yeah. so I would pursue stuff. Some of it would lead to like fascinating things. Like uh, in Morocco I hooked up with a bunch of people that were in the Peace Corps. Sure. And so so and when they found out what I was doing, like this one guy was like, Oh hey. So my I volunteer I'm my post is this really tiny village in the pre Saharan desert. And there is this weird music these guys do where one guy beats on a drum and then this other guy, this incredibly old man, chants the, the oral history of the tribe that they are part of. You gotta come see this. Yeah, no shit. So I was like, done, you know? So I went down to this place, this crazy like area, and all that I was required to do in order to allow for this event to happen was I bought a bunch of meat they were like, if you buy the meat, they will make food, and then the guy will come and sing. Oh. And I was like, great. But I was, so I was like, okay, so here's the money for the meat, blah, blah, blah. The meat, which is, turned out to just be a sheep's head. Sure. Uh, and then we all had to eat it, and oh. it, was, it was like um, the fatty cheek deposits right. of a sheep's face is uh -huh. what I was eating. Yeah. In an effort to be like, you know, in one of those situations where you're like, you have to eat it because it's customary and it would be a great dishonor if you choose to not eat the disgusting fatty deposits of cheek glop that are in front of you. I'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, of course, of yeah, course. Yeah. So we're some scooping up like, like <laughs> disgusting, I'm like, oh my God. And then this dude fucking unloads this craziness that is so beautiful and so amazing and so weirdly hypnotic and interesting. And I don't know what he's saying, but somebody's telling me, like he's telling you, this is a story of when they found this area and why their tribe settled here and blah, blah. It's so crazy. you have a translator. Yeah. Is the translator, is the old man uh, chanting in any sort of musical rhythm? Ish. 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 And is the translator keeping in tow with that? No. No, of no, course not. No, he's kind of coming in and so out. So you've got this beautiful thing happening over here and then the straight Then somebody else, then my friend who was the guy who lived in this village right. would be like, okay, so in this song is about this yeah. conflict and how they came out of it or whatever. Anyway, it was crazy and amazing. Yeah. But then there would be other times where I would like, I lived in Egypt for a long time and was constantly trying to get in touch with one guy who was this jazz drummer in Egypt who had been a part of like all these kind of influential bands and I just could never get to him. So I spent months chasing one person and then it amounted to nothing. Wow. And so that was super tough. So I wasted, I didn't waste because I also had an amazing time in Egypt, but the, I, was in, I was so in pursuit of one thing thinking that was gonna crack that country thing open for me. Yeah, of course. Just didn't work. You're 21, 22-ish? 22, 23-ish All right. at that point. I was way off. Um, 22, 23, you've been given money to go abroad on your own. Yeah. On a weekly average, how much of your focus is on uh, the female human body? 
Very little. Uh -huh. I mean, in Morocco, I wind right. up dating a girl who is one of the Peace Corps volunteers. Uh -huh. So that is Not great. just volunteering for the Peace Corps. No, she's also volunteering for my penis. <laughs> um, she is stationed both a couple of hours south of me and a couple of inches south of me, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, boy. This is terrible. <laughs> Um, no, so so during that period of time, yeah, no, totally, we're we're hooking up and having fun. But a lot of the other time, like there, I'm not meeting a lot of like I'm like I'm li I'm living in Egypt or I'm living in Turkey. I'm just straight up not meeting a lot of women, you right. know, unless they are like you know, um, uh, like like in I live in Israel for a couple of months and somebody puts me in touch with, somebody's like, oh, I know somebody that lives in Israel, who's at school in Israel. And so I wind up meeting a group of people and wind up having kind of like a little make out with somebody there. But it's impossible to pursue, In my, I found it very impossible as a solo person in like Muslim countries to pursue dating. Yeah, no, of course. I have another question for you then. Yeah. How was the Moroccan porn and where were the best places to get it? Almost imp okay. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Well, there is. There's like there would be dirty magazines, uh -oh. and I wouldn't. I, would, uh, I, I was not like. I, it, it's just. It was. Kind of, it was weird. Like yeah. the stuff that was there was. It was very bizarre. Right. Uh, it was also like um, sexy burkas. That culture was very kind of incredibly segregated. Men and women very segregated. Very. Um, and so like it was almost impossible. Almost completely impossible to even have a casual conversation with a woman. You know, just kind of like in public, whatever. I would find it very hard to just chat with people. Right. You know, it was kind of disrespectful. You yeah, know, are you chatting in uh, what's the French, French. Uh, uh, Moroccan, the Arabic. Uh, you know, and, and French are the two things. And then there are other like there's Berber language in Morocco. This is you had there's to pick up these languages. I knew French-ish, and then I. I study, like while I was there, I got somebody to kind of give me every week a lesson in Arabic, just like street Arabic, like very kind of bare bones stuff. You knew French-ish, so yeah. like Pepe Le Pew stuff? Yeah, like I could speak Ameri I could speak English in a French accent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, like, so where is he? Uh, no, I spoke, I, I mean, like I took high school French, so that was it. You know what I mean? Like that's what was getting me by. Right. And then by being there, I quickly was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. If I don't f fucking figure language out, I'm going to freak out. Yeah. You know? Um, so, yeah. So then friend, my French got better and my Arabic was eh, meh. It was fine. Right. It was and good enough to get around. And in Egypt? Egypt, my Moroccan, my, my Moroccan Arabic was not very good in Egypt. <laughs> Egyptians would be like, what are you doing? What are you saying? Um, Egypt, a lot more English speakers. Oh, okay. um, and, then, uh, and then, yeah, kind of same street level Arabic kind of stuff would get me by. And do you eventually grow uh, tired or lean into, no, no, I'm not from around here? Oh, co people constantly. Right. There is, uh, I was on a train in Morocco once and I got onto a car and I just sat there and like six Americans piled into the car and just started having like the douchiest conversation in the world. About you? No, oh. just about the country and about eh, just it's American just douche horrible bags. people. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there and blah, 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 blah. And then the guy comes around and he's, uh, he doesn't speak English. Um, uh, and he's asking them for tickets or I can't remember if it's for their tickets or if they need to buy tickets or whatever he's saying to them. They're like, do you speak English? We don't understand. I'm sorry. Do you speak English? And and so at a certain point, I go, he's asking if you've bought tickets or you need to buy tickets, you know? Uh, and then they all were like, oh shit, <laughs> this guy speaks English. <laughs> like, what are, what have we been saying? What have we been talking about? Like, because we've been on the train for like maybe 20 minutes at that point, and they've sure. just been talking freely, assuming I spoke no English. And that would happen to me constantly. Yeah, is people would just approach me and immediately start engaging me in either Arabic or French or whatever. Just whatever like, Whatever language they spoke. Uh, the thing that gave me away, or the, if people would speak English to me, the thing that would give me away just was clothing. If I just was dressed too foreign, you right. know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which does beg the question, how old were you when the Mansukas uniform <laughs> uh, came into effect? Um, you, you the know, Mansukas uniform... It's of, on the uniform, it's on the internet. 
It is on the internet. Uh, oh, yes. There's, it, took, it took people a while to figure it out, but it's on there. It's on the internet. It's, uh, there are lots of news coverage. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the research dossier, it comes up. Okay. It I'm not it? kidding. <laughs> the, All right. Jamie, I think, mentioned it at, at one point, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago when, when I mentioned we were thinking about having you on. And she asked, I wonder what he'll be wearing. Oh, and I knew me. what she meant. Yeah. So, and, and by the way, she said it not groundbreaking yeah. in, in, her, in her effort. <laughs> uh, you know, there was no, I wonder if anyone did. Yeah. Uh, was there a moment in time? Because, you know, I, I was a big fan of, uh, of early uh, Samuel Clemens. Sure. Uh, uh, who, you know, yep. it was seven of the same. Yeah. That hung in the closet. Didn't, didn't want to spend a minute ever thinking about what am I going to wear. And I made the same choice. And basically. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and for me, and it, it, I've, been do, I've worn this same thing uh, for maybe three years, three, a little over three years consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, I did it on and off before that. Right. Uh, but wore versions of, but like, White shirt and like white Oxford and I mean this white these I mean it's now gotten very rigid you know like um, this uniform I have worn consistently for a little over three years um, but probably six years I've worn almost this outfit in a conscious attempt to rid yourself of this Choice. of this decision making yeah. um, and I list and and part of it is uh, the simplification I love that idea of just simplifying something down to its essence. I don't want to decide this. Mm -hmm. um, and, for, and part of it, and this is going to sound, uh, there is a bit of pretension to this. Another thing that I did was I lived in these Greek monasteries for a long time, or not for a long time, for a little while, to do this other project. And in these monasteries, uh, I was having a conversation with this monk who was like, uh, for us, uh, because he, he was saying when he, uh, he had a job, his job was like like pruning the trees and doing all this kind of stuff, and he had done it every day, right? And I was like, and I was saying to him, I was like, it, now why don't you just change jobs? Like, you, there's this many of you here. Why don't you ever like mix it up? And he was like, that would defeat the purpose. He was like, when I arrived, we needed a guy that pruned the trees, so that became my job, and that will be my job until I die. Wow. Because for for us. Every minute we spend thinking or deciding or choosing anything else that isn't just um, a focus on prayer, a focus on um, having and promoting some sort of ecstatic union with God. Uh, every time I'm focused on earthly things, that is... Time taken away. Time taken away from what I'm here to do, right. which is communicate with God. So that's why we wear the same thing. That's why we grow our beards. That's why we do the same job. It is as much as you can on autopilot. So then you can just spend your mental energy on what you want to be doing, which for them was and if you, union with God. If for you, choosing uh, your clothes for the last three years yeah. would have kept you from... Don't know. <laughs> Who knows? God. It's, oh boy. Is right? it? Is it God? Yeah. No. For me. No. For me. I think it, I'm. I'm trying to like. I'm trying to simplify so I can make. I'm. I mean. I'm. I should be making choices like professionally, personally <laughs> yeah. that I should be making. Yes. I. I, I don't have a dining room table. No. I need a new car. There's like real choices <laughs> I need to make here. You know. Yeah. Um, I can't worry about. Am I going to wear a plaid shirt today? <laughs> right. I mean, are we still doing I don't know. It's, I don't want to show up and everybody's wearing like a blue and white check gingham shirt. <laughs> oh, well, no, you know what? White yeah. shirt and jeans. Yeah, and, and if someone's wearing your thing, then... Uh, I, went on a, then I went on a date recently and the girl showed up in a white shirt and jeans. No, she didn't. Having no idea. Right. Uh, and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> This is gonna be weird, <laughs> and it, it, was, it was like we looked like we were like a weird couple that like dresses the same. Yeah, I was like, you don't know this, but, but. you have accidentally worn my uniform to our date, which <laughs> uh, it, it is of course what you want to describe to someone. Uh, yeah, you, no. got, you got off on the right foot. Oh yeah, 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 and you'll be married next spring. Oh gosh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> so after this incredible uh, journey, yeah. At what point during that journey does it become clear to you that you need to return not only to the States, but to a pursuit of, of all things funny? 
I don't know. It's ne- well near the end of this trip. I get really like, I get really um, consumed with what am I going to do next? You yeah. know, like because there is no there's no application for what I've been doing, and there is no next evolution of what I've been doing. Like this truly, this thing truly is a finite piece of my life. You know, it, you realized that it was a personal experience and not an actual. Uh, it wasn't an academic pursuit. Academic. It pursuit. wasn't. It wasn't going to lead to a career. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to go then in, to graduate school in ethnomusicology. There wasn't anything to it. It really was. They've given me this money. I'm going to have this experience and become self-sufficient. Oh yeah, and and by the way, it was easily the most important like growth period of my life. With like easily, yeah. Um, and so then it really was. I want to go. I, I want to. I was going to come back, and then um, I wanted to move to New York and uh, and do comedy. It really was it. And uh, and so I did. I came back to the U.S. I came, I went came back to Nahant first. And then visited New York a couple of times, uh, and, and this was around the same time that the Upright Citizens Brigade had come to New York. Right. So I saw a show they I saw like a show like an improv show they did. Like this is before they had a theater, and they were just renting theater spaces. Right. Um, and was just like holy shit, oh, oh my god. Uh, and so then yeah, moved in May of '98 to New York, and uh, yeah, started you, taking classes. Yeah, you started. Uh, uh, almost right away, and, and um, was it sort of the early goings of these classes that you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that part of it seemed to have just started. It was brand. It was not brand new. I was kind. Of, there was a when 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 they first came and started uh, teaching classes and performing. The Upright Citizens Brigade, uh, Matt, Matt, Amy, and Ian, very quickly became like the darlings of New York kind of comedy in a way like everybody there wasn't a, New York was a stand up town right you know it was governed by stand up comedy and the only improv that existed unlike New York or yeah, unlike rather Chicago or LA which had like really you know whether it's Groundlings or Second Improv City. Olympic or Second City right. New York didn't have any of that wow. and New York was all stand up clubs and then Chicago City Limits which was kind of a negligible improv Right. Affair, right? Um, uh, and so well, that's maybe too harsh, but like it was a short form theater that did games, and there was nobody doing like really cool kind of long form improv, and so a lot of people very quickly gravitated towards them, and so the first group of people in were groups that already existed, like there were they were like an umbrella for a bunch of groups that already existed. So there was a bunch of people that came in that included like Andy Daly and Billy Merritt and a whole bunch of people before me, and then like Paul Shear, uh, Owen Burke, Rob Hubel. There was like all those guys were in that mix and then then I kind of came in in that next group of classes uh, and you know all of our teachers there was only like you know th- now there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of students and classes and blah 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 but there was like two classes two level one classes you know of I think 10 or 12 people each and that was it and we all started doing stuff together and uh, it was crazy you know and then we got a theater when Giuliani Closed down all the strip clubs. Mm. Um, we uh, got the opened up your own. Yeah, the, we got the Harmony Theater, which was uh, notorious. We were told for five dollar hand jobs uh, in the bathroom. A tradition you kept going, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, I, which I continue to this day. <laughs> if you show up to the UCB Theater, you can just claim you five dollar hand job from me. I'm gonna regret that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then and then uh, you just started performing as much as possible. Just like, you know, I was a very I instantly was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Like, like hungry for that, yeah. and was really arrogant. Like, I Armando Diaz was the level one teacher at that point, and he was also the kind of um, head writer of the UCB's Comedy Central show, and blah blah blah. And I remember being like at the end of taking like level two, I think, at UCB. I was like, I think I'm ready for to be on a team. I think you can put me on a team. And he was like, that's not going to happen. You just pump your brakes. Yeah, yeah. But super, like, that was it. We were all, like, it was a time period where it felt, like, very important to us that we were all discovering this thing together, you know? And there wasn't a huge audience for it. There wasn't, nobody had agents, nobody had, there was no, there was no professional element to it. You know, there was just, I want to be the best improv, I want to be on the best improv team. I want to put up a sketch show that's better than every sketch show. You know, it was, was, everybody was, it was really just, you would do, there's a great picture 
I think Owen Burke has it in his office. It's Ali Faranakian's one-man show. Uh, he would take a picture of the audience, mm -hmm. and Owen has one of those pictures, and the audience is just all of us. <laughs> you know? And that was it. We would all just do shows for each other, essentially. Right. And it was awesome. It was great. How long did that last before people were actually lining up? Oh, years. Yeah. Years. That's the thing I don't think people are that aware of that I found a little surprising in the, uh, in the research. Thank you, Jason McIntyre, for your wonderful work again. It was uh, 1998, apparently, is when you uh, began at UCB. And it was, um, I don't want to say there was a turning point, but people actually started going to shows on a regular basis a good four or five years oh, yeah. later. And, oh, yeah. I mean, for sure. You know, and, and it's maybe, I'm trying to think. That's a long education. It's a very long, there's, and there's also, it's also, when the theater opens, the theater isn't even open every night of the week. Right. You know, at the beginning, the theater's only open three nights a week. So they're programming three nights a week. So then they would slowly roll out a new night and try and find shows for it. And so then they would try and find an audience for those shows. So you would freak, we would frequently be doing, I did a show for, I mean, if you think about it this way, like, stage time at the, at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater right now is like, like gold. You know, like, to get stage time on that theater, we were drowning in stage time. I did a show for a year, once a week, in which I played Ricky Martin. <laughs> and it was, it was a show called Cartoon Chaos, and it was based on the kind of old Saturday morning cartoons where like the Harlem Globetrotters would solve mysteries. Yes. It was that, except it was me playing Ricky Martin, Danielle Schneider playing Kathy Lee Gifford, Somebody playing Woody Allen, somebody else playing a talk, John Daly playing Sappity Tappity, a talking Christmas tree. And we did a show for a year. Sappity Tappity? Sappity Tappity, yeah. That was, James Easton played a robot. It was, it was never good. <laughs> <laughs> this show uh, that we did for a year, that had like a real slot, was never good. Not once. Never once. This is a show that is that very famously, I'm pretty sure this is the show. We were on stage, Matt Besser crea created the show and kind of directed the show. And at a certain point, he came back from, the, the sound booth was in the back of the theater, on the, but on the same level as us. And he came back from the sound booth midway down and put his hand to the audience and lit a lighter under his face and went like this. What is Shook his head to us on stage like, you're fucking up. <laughs> like, what, what are you guys doing? And I just remember all of us being like, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, because we were all like, it, it really was like, everybody was so hungry for stage time and so wanted to be, for us, at the time, we were working out everything yeah. on stage in front of audiences. Yeah. Like, which is just not done now. Now, yeah. Groups, like, they practice, they rent rehearsal space, blah, blah, blah. They, yeah. Everything, and you, you wouldn't just put a show up like that now, I don't think. Like, people, we would just be like, oh, what about this? Oh, oh, oh. You know, all of a sudden, like, great. Uh, yeah. Nine o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, all right, great. And then fucking garbage. <laughs> we would just put up garbage. But over time. Oh, over time, it got great. Yeah. You know, it got really great. And that, I'm, I'm so grateful for those years of... Yeah improvising like it, it truly for me is that is if you talk about like the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours yes. to master anything yes that to me is that era when I'm I'm performing I'm taking classes eventually I'm teaching classes I'm directing shows so for years I'm doing ten you know tens of hours of everything a week right. uh, and that that to me is that that's the kind of Woodshedding period that I feel like I get good at. Yeah, well, Thank like you. you said, incredibly valuable and fortunate that you had that kind of time that you were oh, afforded yeah. uh, all those uh, shows to do horribly. Oh yeah, so that you could find your voice, and also in a in an environment that wasn't nearly as competitive as it is now for stage time. Couldn't possibly be. No, I mean like now. Uh, when I was in level one, there right. were two, like I said, there were two level one classes. Almost every single person in those classes was then put on a Herald team eventually. Wow. Almost every single person. Wow. Because there just wasn't the population of people to make, to, you know, there wasn't a lot of people to leave out. What percentage now? I, I can't imagine. Like, very few. Like, almost nobody. Right. Like, no, actually, nobody gets on teams now. Our very own Kenny Chen just went through, I think, the, uh, which? Three, right? Level three? Wow. Wow. Who, who, who taught it? Oh, nice. 
I like Eugene Cordero. That's great. He's You're a good teaching dude. on occasion. I don't anymore, Where but I did for a long time, for right. a real long time, mostly in New York. I taught almost everything in New York. Yeah. Um, for a real long time. Well, listen, it did get to a point in New York where you were not only a part of UCB, but a part of uh, the formation of Mother and then improv shows we used to go out, First Date, the Manzucas Brothers. Yep. Um, so not only are you finding your feet, you're becoming a, a, a improv power to be reckoned with in that world. In that world, I think, yeah. In that world, yeah. that to me, yeah, that... Uh, there's a lot of improv stuff that for me was, like, that was my thing. I was going to be an improviser, you know. Uh, and I wrote stage shows and, like, I got an agent and I got managers because... Uh, for a long time, Jessica St. Clair and I were a, like a Nichols and May style duo. Right. And we would do improv shows and then Sketches. we would do sketch shows. Right. And so that got us development deals or whatever. But for, like, for whatever reason, I was obsessed with improvising. Well, and isn't it the ultimate drug? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. stand-up is a drug in the sense that you're on a high wire act and you're taking the audience for a ride of your choosing and you're responsible for every high and low and you also know in the back of your mind, if you, if you give the wrong push of attitude to any one sentence, they'll turn on you yeah. on a dime and they'll be gone for the rest Let of the show. Let me ask you this. If, okay, because this is what I'm curious about. All right. If you do that and you lose them, because if I, as an improviser, and somebody, somebody, somebody told me this story back to me, they were like, I watched you do something once that I couldn't believe you did, which was you took a joke so far that the audience turned against you, mm -hmm. and then in the scene you looked at the audience and said, don't worry, I'll get you back, and then you did. Yeah, well that's the in way. In stand-up, it's the same thing. can you, you do that you because you're, that. you're locked into what you know you're gonna do for the rest of your act. Yes. But so if you lose them, how do you get them back? <laughs> you mentioned Dana Carver early on. Sure. We started around the same time. He was a year or two in front of me in the San Francisco uh, comedy scene of the late 70s. He was and remains the best at that exact thing. And really? I think a whole generation was kind of born from certainly the alternative scene of the early 90s, mm -hmm. the Patton Oswalds and, sure. and, and um, so on, where it was easy to then break out and say, well, that went horribly. Let's, let's, um, let's see what it's going to take to win you back. But Dana had a way of um, sort of breaking it down as it was happening, yeah. as opposed to waiting a couple of beats. He actually could sense it in the middle and would address and deconstruct it in the moment. instantly. I like that. That's oh, great. It was astonishing. Yeah. And he would personalize it, too. Lady with the blue dress, That what, what, the last sentence I said, did it even make sense to you? I mean, he would really... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of beautiful. Um, but because yeah, that if, to me is If you have an act, yeah. then you're right. You're, yeah. you're in danger. you got to plow through it. Because there is, to me, like that is like one of the central differences between the two yes. is, and you can, of course, there's a middle ground for both. But for me, like the audience in an improv show, the audience is a part of the show. They you know, know. Like it or not, they, so there's a contract between yes. me and them yes. that you're going to provide a suggestion and we're going to do something that's never been done before. So knowing that that's the case, they are more forgiving yeah. and we are more solicitous of their um, attention. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, so that kind of contract, I feel like, plays back and forth. Yeah. I'll interact with the audience constantly in a show knowing that I can seamlessly then keep going back into my scene and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. you know? like, it can go, the, 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 the communication can go any way. But in stand-up, you don't necessarily have that freedom because you're here, there, the contract between a stand-up audi stand audience and a, and a stand-up comedian or a, a sketch show or anything is, oh, wait, I'm the audience. I know you've prepared this. Yeah. So impress me with this thing you prepared. In fact, it's kind of a golden rule in the first 30 seconds you want to relax their sphincters that they're in great hands. And that's and the first thing I would teach an improv class is your greatest problem is that everybody in this crowd knows you're improvising. Right. And if they sense you're scared, you're about to do what is their worst case scenario, which is, oh no, I saw a bad improv show last night. Nothing worse. And everybody's like, oh, so you must have had the worst night of your life. <laughs> you know, because that's what it is. Bad improv is, if you can't own the stage, 80% of improv is just owning the stage. If you can't relax them and say, don't worry, I know you know yeah. we're making this up, yeah. but you're in good hands. Now, that training, allowed you to go into an audition a few years ago for one of the leads in a big, big movie 
with no script and you had to improvise in the audition for what ended up being a good 20 minutes with Sasha Baron Cohen. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh -huh. So all of that training, except for the North Africa, Morocco sure. section, uh, empowered you to own that room. And yeah. what it said in the dossier was you made a creative decision to actually go after him. Yes. Within the audition yeah. for a movie starring him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think at a certain point, people started seeking me out for jobs that required a good improviser. Like, that started to be kind of something that I was known for or that people would want. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that, plus the fact that I look Arab, got me this audition. Because they wanted somebody in this role that would play against Sasha mm -hmm. uh, and would be able to like hold their own improvising with him. That last part being perhaps the most oh, important. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And but the way that the role was described to me was it's the you know the movie's the dictator and he's this kind of like very kind of out of touch out of touch and vicious kind of uh, ruler of a North African country blah 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 and so my character is it, they were like you know you're afraid of him he can have you killed he has everybody killed blah 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 and I was like ooh that's that's a tough part to play if you're always just fearful if you're always low status. If you're always low status and getting walked over, you can't do very much. So I was like, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to play it like, yes, he's low status. Yes, he can be killed by this person, but I'm going to constantly put him on his heels if I can because <laughs> he's playing an idiot, you know. So it was very easy to just start coming, being like, as an improviser, just be like, and they'd given me like two pages, you know, two like weird pages out of context that made no sense. Right. And so we started improvising. And um, and everything he just started doing, I just started going at him, just like questioning him, like like just attacking him. And the, the more I did, the more I could see him kind of being like, well, wait a second, what is happening here? <laughs> yeah. He kind of looked over at the writers and was kind of like, what's going on? And then and he's then, challenging the dictator. Oh yeah, so totally. And then at a certain point, he started to be like, he started to be like, in character. Uh, did you even look at the pages we sent you? Did you even learn these lines? And in character, I'm going, no, I didn't look at this. is nonsense. I don't know. You give me two pages of it. And this is all in Arabic accents. I'm going, you give me two pages of a script and you expect me to understand what I'm supposed to do? No, this is garbage. This is bullshit, you know? And then we're just fighting. And we're just literally fighting back and forth. And then it goes back into the scene again. And it was 20 minutes of just insanity. Right. Just craziness. Oh. And, and, and it was possible. It was really, I mean, he was great. He was great. He's phenomenal. And it was also that I also knew one of the writers was Jeff Schaefer, who okay. created The League, the League, which was a show I was on at that right. point. Uh, one of the guys in the room was Larry Charles, who I'd done a pilot with in the past. So, so I you felt fans relatively protected yeah. in that sense. Do you, know, do you get a sense before you go into that, having made that creative decision, well, I've got a little bit of buffer in the room because of Larry and Jeff or fans of mine, and they probably said to him before I yeah. go in, you're, you're, this is going to be fun. Yeah, like I think it. so. Yeah. Whether or not it was this is going to be fun, I, I felt like they pr had prepared him for the fact that I would be very comfortable improvising. Right. And then, and, but then that, that still didn't get me the job. I still had to do that again, I mean, maybe four or five more times. Really? Yeah. No, I, I kept having to go back in and do it again, but a different version of it. Mm -hmm. You know, can you do it this way? Can you do it that way? Can you do this? Can you do that? And then we would do table reads of it. And then there would be table reads that they would do, and I wouldn't be that character. Somebody else, they would have somebody else do it. This went on for like five, five months, maybe. Wow. Of kind of like up and down. I wouldn't hear anything for a month, and then I'd go back in, and we'd improvise again for half an hour, right. you know. Right. And then I got it, and then uh, yeah, and then we shot it, and it was, and that's what it was. We would do, I mean, and it's. I wish there was more of it on the DVD that we would do takes that were like. 15 minutes long? Yeah, like the Popeye, the... Oh, that whole thing. Was he a sailor man, or yeah, was yeah. he, in fact... It was Professor Popeye? <laughs> Professor Popeye? You know, like, that whole scene, all of that that scene is all of the cartoon <laughs> stuff, all of it is completely improvised. Right. And it happened in that moment. Like, yeah. just, like, the idea that 
he has been watching research films about bombs, uh, and it's just uh, all Looney Tunes cartoons. <laughs> you know, are all the Acme bombs. Uh, I think it's supposed to fly, and then tick, 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 boom. You know, like, <laughs> right. and, and then I'm like, no, I think that's, I think you're watching Looney Tunes, you know? <laughs> and now all of that is improvised. And we did that Was for hours. Sir Ben Kingsley present for this? Oh, yes. <laughs> You know, that scene, especially, that's the first day, that's the first day, not that I met uh, Sir Ben Kingsley, but the first day I worked with him. And he is basically watching you two lunatics. Behave like fucking assholes. <laughs> I, well, he stands there like like Stoic. killing it, yeah. killing it, like a bad, because he's the badass like advisor to the dictator. He and I'm like, at a certain point, I was like, I cannot believe that Sir Ben Kingsley is watching me act like an absolute dildo for hours. Yeah. Yeah. A member of the Queen's Court. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The best. <laughs> way to, the best. Way to piss in his teeth. Oh, uh, he was the best. We did a thing for the promotion of the movie. They were, you know, you have to do all these these junkets and this, yeah. that, and the other. And, and one of the things we were meant to do was a, uh, like a, like a press panel thing. Like, you know, we're all on a stage and people ask us questions and it was, it was me, it was supposed to be me, Sir Ben Kingsley, Sasha, the writers, and Larry Charles. Um, and at the last minute, uh, they canceled everybody but me and Sir Ben Kingsley. So then it is Gandhi and me on a, on a stage at a long table that's supposed to be full of other people entertaining questions from the press. Um. And, I, and the questions are all like, what would you say to other dictators, real dictators in the world? And he, like a fucking pro, every time would have some like cogent, like thoughtful answer on it. And I was just doing bits. I was just <laughs> doing nonsense bits. And I was like, this is the most surreal experience yeah. that it is that in any way, shape, or form, this is what should be happening right now. Like right. that we are, it was like a weird, at a certain point I just started pitching that we were here actually promoting our new movie, which is a buddy cop movie starring the two of us. <laughs> right. And he, he was just looking at me like, what are, you, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? But he yes ended everything. He wanted to, he went out, he was great. Wow. That dude's a home run. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned the uh, Nichols and May thing. So when Variety uh, puts you and Jessica St. Clair in their top 10 comics to watch, this was just a couple of years ago. 2003. Oh, many, many years, years ago. ago. Oh, a, a, a scant, Jason, terrible a, research. A Jason. scant decade. <laughs> a scant decade ago. That's, that's just Kevin. He no, thinks it's 2005. I'll take the hit on that one uh, as an old man. Um, was this around the time that you're doing? Uh, We're doing a show at that point called um, "I Will Not Apologize." I will not apologize. I will not apologize. This is the first sketch show we do. Um, as a couple, as a couple, as a as a team, man and woman. Yeah, but not as a team. We're not a we are we're not a romantic couple, but we are. We went to college together. We did comedy in college together, and then she also moved to New York and started doing UCB around a couple of years after I did, and then we started doing shows together. And we wrote this show, and it went to this is like this is the kind of show that is the kind of tipping point for our careers. I yeah. feel like. We do this show, it's a huge show in New York, we go to the Aspen Comedy Festival, we get agents, we get managers, we get a deal at Comedy Central. We, it like, that was the thing that, that was the, the experience I had that was surreal. Welcome, welcome like, to show business. Welcome to show business. Like, we finished a show at a theater in Aspen, and Aspen, at the, you know, at the time, because it doesn't exist anymore, the Aspen Comedy Festival was you know, the equivalent of like the Sundance Film Festival. It was sure. like a festival where young talent was discovered. Yeah. So all of, a lot of industry would come, all of the shows were pretty much by people who didn't have representation or were unknowns, uh, except for like the premiere shows, which were like Steve Martin would do a show, right. or somebody big would do a show. Matt and, and Trey, were yeah. they were doing a panel, I remember. Yeah, and, totally. That kind of thing. So we did our show, we got a standing ovation, Jesus. which was crazy, Yeah. Uh, and then, People came, like, rushed to the stage and were, like, giving us business cards for, like, to please call me while I'm here. Can we sit down tomorrow? And, like, wanting to sign us and stuff. It was like, we were like, oh, my God, this is how it happened. This is <laughs> yeah. how it happens. And 10 years later, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, along the way, we used to go out. Uh, wasn't that an HBO pilot? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we did, so the uh, the first show we did, a, we did, we wrote a pilot for Comedy Central that we didn't do. And then we did another stage show called We Used to Go Out that was this kind of 
there was more of like a, it was a sketch show, but it told one long story about a couple breaking up. And it right. was like super sad and really funny and dark. And, <laughs> uh, and we sold that to HBO and we did a pilot based on that around the same time. It was when HBO decided they wanted to do like low budget stuff. Mm -hmm. So they made Flight of the Concords and they made our pilot. And then there was another one, I think. And uh, yeah, we made this kind of low budget kind of the pilot about a, a couple who are in the process of going through a horrible breakup. Yeah. And it was really funny and really dark. And it was also like coming off of, for me, a horrible breakup. So it was very oh, easy wow. to be like, like just like channel, channel everything into this thing. And that, that was a huge show for us. Uh, and that deal was a huge deal for us to like, the idea at the time that we were gonna have an HBO show was mental. Yeah. You know, it was really, it was awesome, it was exciting. Uh, all in New York. We did it all in New York. Yeah, I was wondering how you were able to uh, thrive at the level that you were in New York and and decide to go west, young man. Because it was shortly after, I think, according to the dossier, if I've read this correctly, you and Ed won the $10,000 Friars Club competition, <laughs> improv competition, um, right? Shortly thereafter? Within a year and a half or so? Let me, I was probably already here by then. By the time you guys won that? By the time we won that, I okay. think. We did that, that was like a ran, that was like a real weird one-off thing. We just, we, they, uh, the Friars Club does a, I hadn't known about it, but they do this improv competition, and they do an improv competition and a sketch competition. And my friend Ed Herbstman and I do an improv show in New York called the Manzukis Brothers that is this kind of very, uh, aggressive, deconstructive improv show where we, but we improvise a lot. But there is a there's a huge portion of the show that is just an attack on the audience. Wow. Um, uh, that is that is me antagonizing the audience to walk out essentially, right. and him <laughs> imploring them not to. Um, you described it as you're just trying to destroy each other. Yeah, yeah, we're constantly trying to kill each other. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Almost every scene in the show ends in one or the other of us dying. Um, and so, so we had been doing that show on and off in New York for a while. And so the Fri the Friars thing, they they asked us to be one of the groups that represented improv, and we won. Uh, and and the, the, there's a prize, and we made a short film and all this stuff. Uh, but it's around yeah, it's around that time, 2009, 2010. I'm also at that time doing a pilot for NBC that I created called Off Duty. So it, during that year, I'm going back and forth a lot to LA to work on that show, to cast that show, to so I got more of a. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my friends had moved to L.A. Yeah. at that point, and I started dating someone who lived in L.A. So suddenly, like, L.A. didn't seem so you should be miserable. The, you should be L.A. at that UCB point. UCB had opened already at, yeah. that, at that, around that time. So I was like, okay, now the concept of going to L.A. doesn't seem so miserable to me. Like, I'll have a theater to perform in. A lot of my friends are there now. Mm. This, why not? And so that was kind of the impetus was, and oh, and my, once my NBC show didn't get picked up, I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna go. Let's go, I'm gonna go to LA and I'm gonna see what happens. Yeah. It was great. Uh, not too long after you get the call for the league to uh, do like maybe four episodes. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Four or five episodes, see how it goes, kind, yeah. of, kind of thing. They wanted, yeah, they, I had auditioned for the league originally to play the part that, to, well, I had auditioned originally to play the parts that Paul Shear plays and Mark Duplass play, plays. Um, and got really close, uh, but didn't get them. And then the Schaefers who created the show said, uh, in, if we get season two, um, there's a, there is a character we would like you to do. Uh, just hold on, if, you know, just, you know, just so you know. Uh, and then they did get season two and we uh, had a meeting and they were like, okay, well the character is this, it's gonna be Nick Kroll's brother-in-law and he comes into the league and then they don't like him so they get rid of him. Um, it's up to you, how would you like to do that? What version, originally his name was Sheldon, you know, and there, it, it was a little bit more of like, I think in their eyes, like not as, it was a little bit more of a, an annoying character. And I was like, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. I, I want to play a maniac. I want to, I want to come on your show and I want to be an absolute maniac that is just like it, kind of chaos. Because at that point, I'd also watched the show, and I was like, everybody seems like the, I loved all the archetypes, right. and I was like, you don't have the lunatic. You don't have a lunatic, basically. And I was like, and I've got a great lunatic. 
Um, so was it someone that you had through the sketch work and stuff? Had it's kind it's, of created. It's a character that I had played versions of. Right. Yeah. In the in the show I did with Saint Clair called We Used to Go Out. Um, once her and I break up as characters. Oh, then um, you play other. She goes on a date with a guy who's a maniac. Who's very much like my character, very much like Rafi on the League. Like, a charming, lovable, stone-cold maniac. <laughs> who, like, they go on a date and he brings her back to his place, which is a storage locker. Sure. Um, and e everything in the locker is horrifying. <laughs> and all I keep saying is, guess what time it is? It's no shirt o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to take her shirt off. It's just, so, it's like so, it like is so lovable in moments and then so rapey in moments <laughs> sure. that you just cannot figure it out. And, so, and that's, and Rafi is just that, like t taken to like the next level. Right. Yeah. Um, and now they can't get enough. So this, what's yeah. nice is that they'll spice you in. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. And at a certain point they were like, you know, I think because the character I you know, is like bizarrely beloved. People are obsessed with this character. But he can kind of take over an episode before, oh, yeah. before you know it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, no, no. Though that's the thing is that I always say this, and I think it drives everybody else crazy, is R Rafi is never responsible for story. Anything. So I don't have to justify anything. I don't have to, there's never a point where they're like, oh, Jason, make sure you put out the information that you guys need to meet up later and talk about the draft. <laughs> they're like, Jason, if you want to keep talking about fingering the guys, I, I guess you can. <laughs> uh, well, this was startling. Again, I hope this is correct from the... Because, you know, we watch the show, but I asked Jamie, and she has seen every episode, I think. I don't think people know that the stories are written, but none of the dialogue. None is. of the dialogue is written. None of the dialogue. Yeah. That's so, astounding. Yeah. How do people, how does everyone not, I mean, that's. It's crazy. It's crazy. Everything we get, we don't get a script, we get a, like a story breakdown, which is like, I mean, maybe I eight, you call ten it pages. A, a scriptment? Yeah, like sure, something like that, yeah. So it's basically the story of the episode told in scenes. Right. So it'll be like, you know, exterior bar, you know, the guys are talking about whatever, um, you know, everybody's busting each other's balls, and then any piece of story information that's necessary, and then and then whatever, you know, and then that's it. That's the guy, it's a guideline. Um, and so we'll start first with like a super long take, that is just everybody trying to figure out mm -hmm. how they can, what their point of view is or what their what their take on it is. And certainly like Jeff and Jackie will give lines, give dialogue, like, I, oh, I thought of this joke or whatever, you might, your point of view might be this or whatever. But it starts off with a huge improvised scene. Hour and a half like you guys did back at the... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A huge improvised scene and then that gets like honed and winnowed down to, okay. So now we kind of get it. So now it's we're gonna do. Let's keep. Let's let's stay within this kind of. Okay, you come in. Ba ba ba. You're gonna say this. You come in some version of this. Ba ba ba. And then, but if my character is in it, I I will destroy everything. <laughs> I will just inherently try and touch someone's dick. Try and uh, try and t punch somebody. Anything. You know. Like, like I'm the person who is constantly saying like, "Hey Frank, who's the props guy? Do we have a knife or a gun or anything threatening?" Yeah. And he'll be like, "Give me two minutes." Yeah, do you have one of those bombs from the cartoons? With totally. Just a round black. I will. I will make it work in this scene, um, and that's what it is. Yeah, the, the whole show is improvised, wow. uh, top to bottom, uh, and they, it, it, which is great, and they do a great job because the Schaefer's write scripts that allow for enough interpretation that we can come up with super funny stuff, right. but that they're getting what they need story-wise. So they're always moving towards telling these great interconnected stories, but we also have the freedom to have nonsense diversions about like how big a Smurf's dick is, you know? <laughs> Which we now know significant. Is, uh -huh. <laughs> As we know, Smurfs are three apples tall. Hello. The dicks are an apple and a half. <laughs> you've got a gun to your head. You've got to vote one of the male cast members off the show island of the league. Who's going? Wait, I've got to vote somebody off? Off, off the league island. Gun to your head. And I mean a character from the show oh, or, a character or from the show. one of the actors. I mean, I think probably... <laughs> My, Rafi would probably kill Ruxin, Nick Kroll's character, <laughs> because as it has evolved, yes. Rafi is this, and this is a, this is what's beautiful about the show is that I can improvise stuff that will then be 
put into the canon of the show. Like, I improvised the notion of a character named Dirty Randy, <laughs> right. who is my friend, who is worse than me, in my opinion. Seth Rogen Seth. now plays Dirty Randy, you right. know? And there's a bunch of other stuff that has come to pass simply because, so last this last season, I inexplicably started <laughs> improvising an intense sexual attraction to my sister. Because, right. <laughs> uh, so, so, like, I am Nick Kroll's brother in law, so he's married to my sister. And th episode after episode, I kept, like, becoming more physical with her, <laughs> kissing her on the lips, <laughs> being sexually desirous of her, and then saying that I could do a better job raising his son. <laughs> and it just got, it's the thing that there was, a, there was one episode where she and I had a what I would consider a passionate kiss. Like, a kiss that was not like a normal kiss, that was a passionate kiss, that people reacted viscerally negatively to. <laughs> yeah. People had a real like, whoa, no. You can do a lot, but you cannot have incest on this show. Which, which only made me want to do more of it. I was like, I, I was, I'm, cause I, in my mind I'm, I'm pitching like, there's gotta be an episode where I try and kill Ruxin and then take over the family and all this stuff. So I think that would be it. I would kill Nick Kroll's character. Yeah, yeah. So that I could take over that family unit. Oh man. Uh, here's hoping you can pull oh, that magic off. Like on wood. Uh, they love you so much at FX that you sell them a sitcom. I did. Um, and then you've also recently sold a, an action comedy that you wrote called I've Got Your Girlfriend, a 20th Century Fox. That is true as well. There's no stopping you. There is a, there's no stopping you. <laughs> right. Correct. Correct. Um, how many pitches before the sale on you, I've Got Your Girlfriend? Um, pretty quick. Okay. You know, like I took it around and they were, they were pretty into it. So, yeah. You were And it's with basically some? the movie taken as a comedy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> It is, it is, like, I, would, I watched that movie and I was like, this is amazing. Uh, and then was like, oh, but what if this movie happened to me? Instead of Liam Neeson, who's a trained killer, what would happen if I or any, like, stupid comedian had to execute all of the beats of a hard action movie? Just by, you know, like, I want to watch that. Yeah. I want to watch, like... A Jason Bourne style chase sequence in like the market in Tangiers, only it's Danny McBride instead of Jason Bourne, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just like slamming into things and be, falling downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Uh, I, I hope they're making this soon. It does Let's sound, hope. I yeah. still haven't written it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's anything that can light a candle under your fire and ass, as it were, it's you. Let, it's this, you. let this be it. Um,. Uh, okay, Jamie, did you have any possible John Cusack punchlines? Oh, we get quite a few. Really? <laughs> All right, so do you want to just, Sammy, you give the setup, and then Jamie, you, you lay out do the you punchline? Read, you can read them, Sam. Or yeah. Sammy, you want to lay out the whole thing? <clears throat> All right. I thought I saw John Cusack, but it was just a cactus. Just a cactus. All right. All right. Are we, and are we rating? We're going to oh, yes, rating them. Here's your piece of paper. You got show. your pen. What? At Globe Show. Oh, at Globe Show. Yes. Yeah, well, don't give them credit oh, no, until, we, until we yeah, just... Yeah, these aren't Twitter. These are, these just, are... These are YouTube handles. Okay. YouTube. Okay, so uh, Vincent Canada? He's Can a regular. Can I'll just All say... Right. He knew. It's Vince. Thought I, yeah. thought I saw John Cusack, but it turns out it was just Joan Cusack in a trench coat. Mm -hmm. these are, uh, I'm going to go on record now and say <laughs> these are bad. <laughs> <laughs> and that I regret suggesting. <laughs> your no, pi there's, your there's, pile of jackets, there's, I think. There's at least two good ones in here. Okay. Uh, Isaiah Granville says, I thought I saw John Cusack, but it was just Carl Rove's foreskin. I at least appreciate the effort. <laughs> very, po very political. <laughs> yeah, very political. Wait, uh, and are we to presume then <laughs> that Carl Rove is uncircumcised? <laughs> is that is that the is that what's happening? And this is a that was a multi-layered joke. And it's like, oh, I looked over and I saw <laughs> Carl Rove with his dick out, <laughs> and he's uncircumcised. Yeah. And I thought it was John Cusack. <laughs> I have notes on this joke. Yeah. This is too many steps. <laughs> okay, foreskin, Carl Rhodes foreskin. All right. Uh, B-Town Zombies says, I thought I saw John Cusack, but it was just a vampire. A and vampire? I think that's a personal <laughs> attack on John Cusack. And saying then, that uh, he looks gaunt and tired and black circles around the eyes. Yeah. And uh, Gustav Berg, sure. uh, rounding them all that's up, says, name. I thought I saw John Cusack, but it was just Q. John Sack. 
Better joke is I thought I saw John Cusack and instead I saw Gustav Berg. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Why not just commit? Look, you our, son of a bitch. Our viewers tried. Yeah. yeah. And oh. failed. <laughs> failed, but they tried. Uh, I love that I wrote down all of them in case <laughs> in case it was necessary for me to return to them. I was like, I've got cactus, You're I've got Joan Cusack in a trench coat, Carl Rose foreskin. Oh god, thank god. Oh, I'm so nervous. You started this interview before we went live, going, Am I gonna have to write anything down? Yeah, I did. Do you, yeah. Do you have paper? For, am I? I want to be able and to I, take notes. I wasn't gonna let the, the whole thing go without him writing something down, and we've, thank we've accomplished this. Now we have a few direct questions from the audience watching live. Let's hear them. This one comes to us from the Twitterverse, at Peter Riggs. If Peter could, Riggs? Uh-huh. If you could spend a whole day with Chev Chelios. Chev Chelios? Chelios. From the Crank movies. Mm -hmm. Jason Statham's character from the Crank movies. What would you do? Oh, I mean, oh, wait, a day? Yeah. Okay, so I'm presuming this is one of the days in <laughs> Chev Chelios' life where somebody has altered his body in a way such that if he doesn't do X, Y will happen. Mm -hmm. In which case, I am going to have the best day of my life. <laughs> Why? Because because I'm gonna I'm gonna like I'm gonna watch him murder people. We're gonna drive cars. They're probably gonna like f turn into submarines. We're gonna he, like he's gonna fuck Bai Ling. I hope. If not, somebody's gonna fuck Bai Ling. Let's be honest. If Bai like if Bai Ling's not involved, yeah. I'm furious. Yeah. Um, I, I want to like I want to like race cars. I want to do I, like all those movies are Is are it? just. Chaos, yeah, insane level chaos um, with the best. Like to me, Jason Statham is the fucking best action movie star in existence right now. Uh, how did this person know you were so? Uh, oh, that, this is straight up. How did this get made? Savvy. Yeah. I see. This is how this, this is get a, made. a true fan of. Yeah. Excellent. So this is the podcast. So I do a podcast called How Did This Get Made? Right. Which is also thank you, thank you, Sam. Um, Whatever, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie's, Boo. A, Jamie's a huge fan, actually. You couldn't nothing, clap, though, huh? The Nothing But Trouble episode. <laughs> oh, yes. Made. Share. That movie, Nothing But Trouble, <laughs> the movie that Dan it's Aykroyd directed. Oh, my God. Real. I'm like, Dan Aykroyd to me, like, I watched all those old SNLs. Like, I, if, but if, if you said, oh, Jason, here is Dan Aykroyd for you to talk to for 15 minutes, that's all he has. All I would talk to him is about <laughs> is this movie. And I, not his would, vodka? Nope, not his vodka and not his alien theories either, which are Fantastic. myriad and fascinating. Um, no, this movie, that movie is truly one of the most fucked up things I've ever seen. In my yeah, life. It is, it's of disturbing. And I've seen a lot of it's fucked up things. It's wildly disturbing. His, his character. prosthetic penis nose? <laughs> <laughs> Just Google Dan Aykroyd cock nose yeah. and see what happens yeah. in America. Um, so we do this podcast called How Did This Get Made, which is we watch, in theory, terrible movies or movies that have wildly gone off the rails or whatever. You and Paul Shear. Me, Paul Shear, and June, uh, Diane Raphael, who uh, are all kind of, we all, Paul and I, and then June is, is younger than us, but we all kind of came out of New York around the same time. Um, uh, and we do a podcast where we have a guest on and we sit and we watch the movie. We have watched the movie. And then we just to have a, a conversation about it that is like usually some version of what the fuck is happening here. <laughs> yeah yeah of course um and uh and it's everything from the crank movies which are on the top end of the spectrum of mm -hmm. like the best of terrible movies right to uh, like fast and furious count as that those are all great all the Nicolas cage movies but then truly truly bad movies like the last airbender or green lantern which are just absolute horrible disasters <laughs> right. that you would never want to sit through. Right. Oh, uh, man. Uh, I, I've had three uh, emails from Paul about coming on the show. You have to. He knows that I'm dying to. Each of the three were dates that I was working or something was fucked up. But I'm determined to get on the show. I feel like, wait, do you, is there a movie that we can do that you were in? Oh, of course. Are you kidding? What? Lot. You're great. looking for bad? Yes. Well, there's plenty. Okay, great. That's yeah. what I want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. My that, suggestion was 3,000 Miles to Graceland. There you go. I'm great. You want a man? No. Is, come on. That's too obvious. You've got to go 3,000 Miles to Graceland. Well, if right. you, well, I think, I th yeah. That would be a good thing. I'll say this to your audience. Yes. You tell us oh, which boy. which movie. No. Well, there's a few. Sure. Which one? Because I would, I would love it. Because the most fun ones are when people come on to talk about a movie they have been in. Yeah, no, I... Or I, they have been, they have worked on in some way or whatever. Like, that's, 
that's always fascinating. I'm pretty open about about the things that went wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of uh, proud-ish that I, I, I never signed up to do a movie knowing it was bad and, right. and yet a good paycheck. But there's so many ways to go bad, oh, yeah. you find out over the years, that it's astonishing. In fact, that a good film comes out of any of these mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. deals is kind of a miracle. Oh, completely. So out of 70-something movies, there are six that I would point to that I really? would say these are really, a, by these the way, are really good. Oh, oh. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You've got 60-something <laughs> films to choose from. That did not turn wow. out right. all right. Yeah, all right. yeah. Good. At least 30 to choose from. Great. You could go. Let's do it. It's a toss-up. I love that. <laughs> but I've got, I've got probably a top 10 list. Top 10 bad. That I would uh, point you towards. All right. And uh, there's two mentioned right there. I like that. Yeah, there are parts of these films that almost work, and and, well, and that's the case. But that's and some of the fun, of, right? Yeah, and for us, there is, you know, a lot of times we will get into a conversation where we're like, oh, I can see in these scenes here what they're trying to do, and had the whole movie been this, it would have worked. Did you deconstruct um, M Night? His career, his his trajectory. A little bit, a little bit. The one you know? with the wind is the enemy. The happening was it. Yep. Great trailer. Oh, Still have not seen that one. Great. Still have not seen that one. I know. Seriously? It's terrible. It's like one of the top ones we you have. Remember to do. the trailer though, with the people falling oh, off yeah, buildings, yeah. and totally. everyone's like, "This looks like the greatest movie ever yeah. made. What is oh, happening?" Yeah. And then, which is, and the answer is, the happening. Yeah. Is what is happening. So, but you've heard this spoiler alert already from other people other than me. That, Completely. That the wind yeah. in the trees turns out is the, the thing they're running from. Yeah. 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 And, uh, by the way, my uh, email invite to appear on the show and trash one of my movies keeps going to my spam box. Ah, oh really? So I have got to, I've got to check. Let's that correct that in, in Kansas City. Oh, that sounds great. Let's get correct that your, in get Kansas City. Get rid of that City. spam box. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> all right, we do another thing on the show where a uh, fan will direct a specific line of five questions to you. Great. They are this or that, Coke or Pepsi. No correct answer, just opinion answers. Oh, okay, got it. Um, and we call them Tweet Five. T five. T5, T5 forever now. I hear Keckner may not be there in, in the Kansas City. Did you hear this? Is that right? He's, got, he's working on Come something. Come on, Keckner, get that. it together. Um, so, ready? Yes. This is from at Birdie McFan01. Uh, I'm going to have a... In, in case, because that person was nervous, Win. there would be more Birdie McFans. Win. Thank you. Yes. That's exactly right. So he was like, oh, I got to get zero one so people know I was the original. <laughs> That's right. James Wynn or Martin Scorsese? Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Scorsese. Okay. How bad? Am I pronouncing that correctly? No, Wynn is perfect. That's, that's it's yeah. Vietnamese last name. Yeah, no, I was, I, I'm laughing because I'm like, oh, this is a choice between terrible or great. <laughs> so I was deciding whether to go with terrible or great, but I'm going to go with Scorsese. Uh, you're Who's wondering? capable of terrible? Let's let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, suggest. London, anybody? <laughs> yeah. Wait, I, I have a weird. Here's a weird story about the movie Kundun. Uh, they were shooting that in Morocco, and I lived in Morocco. So there was a period of time where I I was in a I was in not a like a town um, that is like an in between spot in Morocco. So I would wind up in this one town a lot to get him from place to place, and it was full of uh, Tibetan monks. Oh my god! So in the middle of Morocco would be all of these Tibetan monks in the kind of saffron robes. Like, I mean, yeah, it looked so crazy and weird. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Martin. Um, your wonderful character from the league, or Nadal? Uh, I'll take Rafi over Nadal. Got to go with Rafi. I always got to go with Rafi. Uh, UCB, New York, or L.A.? Uh, I'll always choose New York. That's Please. my home. What are Come we on. talking about? Curl Show or Key and Peel? Um, I do. Lo I love both. I'll choose Kroll Show just because I work on Kroll Show, uh, <laughs> and 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 I haven't worked on Key and Peele, but I think Key and Peele is amazing. Yeah, they are astonishing. They are boy, oh boy, crazy fun. Kroll Show for me, just a new drug. I cannot get enough of Oh Hello. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> season two of Kroll Show, which just wrapped shooting, which I did a bunch of stuff on, is going to be, I think, next level crazy. Oh. Is it literally off the hook? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and then the last one is a uh, dog or wife. Dog or wife? Hmm. 
Well, I have neither currently. <laughs> oh, God, what am I doing? <laughs> ah! Why does this person want to hurt you? Oh, God. <laughs> I am unsuccessful in love, and my dog died this year. So, no! so thanks a lot, <laughs> asshole who asked that question. How dare you? Well, maybe Bertie McFan01 knew you were going to oh. make fun of the 01 and thought they would do maybe preemptive hurt. Yeah, maybe that's it. Um, uh... I'll choose dog right now just because uh, I love I love my dog. <laughs> sure, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, and then um, another uh, tweet five popped up, so let's just go right to let's, it. Let's do it. Where is we uh, another? We have a, what are we doing? Another D Kekner? T well, he usually five, comes in every one. T five. But uh, thank you for not five, doing it this time. I will not do until it until I, I see that. Until I start. <laughs> <laughs> this is from at xx goots. X. Double X Goots Double X. <laughs> uh, single X on the end. Settle down. Oh, boy. Writer or actor? Writer. Again with the Rafi or Dennis Feinstein. It's the character that I play on Parks and Rec, mm -hmm. which is, let's be honest, Rafi in a suit. I see. Uh, <laughs> absolutely also a lunatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. At this point, I just play variations on a sociopath. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'll take Rafi again. Podcast host or guest? Um, hmm. That's a good one. I'll take host. Yeah, I would think so because, uh, forgive me for repeating my own damn joke that I'm too enamored with, but it's the new version of jury duty now in L.A. To be a guest? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on. <laughs> well, that's why I have that's to repeat it. That's amazing. Yeah. That's why I have to repeat it because yeah. it is actually that's one of good. the few funny jokes. There I is tell. a lot of uh, come yeah. do the podcast. Ooh. A lot of So it. thank you again. Oh, uh, please. Number four, Dick Puncher. I'm not on Twitter. Um... <laughs> tough call. It is a tough call. Signature piece. I'll take, I'm not on Twitter, guys. Okay. And spaghetti roe butter side by side. <laughs> those, are both, those are two very good episodes of How Did This Get Made. Uh, I'll take spaghetti robot, <laughs> uh, which is uh, Judge Dredd, I believe. Um, <laughs> these are, June's understanding of movies leads to the best How Did This Get Made moments where the, that one in particular is her belief, perhaps, that this tr robot that had trash within it was perhaps uh, controlled by the spaghetti that was inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> it there's been some really good ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, 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 folks can find uh, How Did This Get Made on the iTunes and the Earwolf, right? Of course. Um, the League comes back... In the fall. In we the start fall. shooting in... in uh, we start shooting mid-July, right? So it'll come back in the fall. Um, and then what else can we guide people towards? Oh, um, For uh, of course my Twitter, which is non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how did this get made? And blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to think. I got nothing else to plug. I'm not a big plugs. Well, person. and we don't really do that on the show. I'll but be I, but I'll I... be appearing live at the Borgata. Just kidding, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be at the uh, blackjack table. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, I we loved uh, seeing you and uh, one of your many improv groups at the UCB Los Angeles. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Sound. If you live in Los Angeles, come to the soundtrack every Friday night at 9:30 at UCB. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Sometimes you're there, sometimes you're not. Yeah, right. Uh, but even if I'm not there, it is fantastic. A group of like it's all old, pretty much old New York and Chicago improvisers yeah. just doing a super fun show. Anytime, come out to that soundtrack 9:30 UCB Los Angeles. Oh and yeah. Also, if you haven't seen it. The Dictator is a really tremendously funny movie. Your work in it is remarkable. Thank you. There I yeah. said it again. And I'll say this. Watch The League on uh, yeah, you on Netflix bitch. or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or as I like yeah. to call it Netflix. 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 See what I did? Netflix. See what I did? Oh, brother. Shit, there's a fan. <laughs> Netflix. Not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not bad. <laughs> See, I, I, I made up for not clapping. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm afraid we ran out of time for the uh, last minute uh, preparations on uh, who tweeted. But you do have an opportunity to wrap things up beautifully with a little Larry. King game. Oh, Larry King game. Shall yes. I reiterate the rules, the boundaries, I, the steps? I am just, I am Larry you King. You are Larry. You're giving me a bad Larry King impression. I don't want to attempt at a good one. Okay. A bad one makes me laugh harder. Okay. And uh, you're just Larry doing a little sharing too much about himself before he goes to the phones. And it could be about anything about Larry's history or, or real life or made up. And it helps if the city you go to on the phone yeah. is a funny sounding city. Okay. But is it a real city? It can, it can be, it should be, but it doesn't have to be. It just needs to be funny sounding. Schenectady yeah. is funny and real. Schenectady funny and real? Yeah. Well, I feel like we could talk about this now for 10 minutes. 
<laughs> okay. Like, what are the real and also funny cities? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, there's Moose Paw, uh, New Mexico, or Arizona, or something. Yep, Handjob, yeah. Utah. <laughs> Handjob, Utah. <laughs> and of course, Pennsylvania is real. That's a is place. that real? That's a place. Um, oh, that we've had every other Larry King game submission had intercourse Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, anyways, it can be made up. Okay. I, I want you to feel as free oh, boy. as you uh, have made a career out of oh, here. Oh, God. That's your camera That's right there camera? when you're ready. Uh, I've right. got prop glasses if you need them for the Larry King. No, I don't think I, I'm going to take I, them. I, I, no. You don't seem like a prop I'm not, guy. I'm no. not a big props person. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so it's just Although I'm glad anything. you had that pen, otherwise I don't think right? we could have got through this interview. Right? <laughs> I get very fidgety, so I gotta have my pen. And yeah. then look what I did with it. You did. Well, you Carl Rove's foreskin. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna need you to sign that, that's gonna be framed. We're gonna start a... Uh, I feel like that's to me is I, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with that. That could be the name roots. of the town. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> I spent the better part of the summer Sharing a bunk with Carl Rove, his foreskin looked like something that I've never seen before and tasted like something even worse. <laughs> Wet Fart Ohio, you're on the phone. <laughs> did I do it right? Yeah, yeah, you did. I, yeah. I, it's my been favorite the most miserable week of my life in Wet Fart Ohio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I saw John Cusack. <laughs> Turns out it was a wet pile of blankets. <laughs> <laughs> that was still the best one we got. Come on. The very pile, first submission. Pile of coats? Yeah, yeah but pile of coats. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Um, thank you so very much. Thank you. This was amazing. Honestly and truly. Um, I look forward to uh, my appearance, my jury duty. Please. On, uh, how I love this. Get, how did this get made? Oh, yeah. We will break down one of the 17 films that I did that uh, <laughs> may not have ever come out. Oh, I would uh, love nothing more. Yeah, well, I, I would think so. Um, again, yes, thank you. Sit there uncomfortably for 60 seconds while I wrap this up. I will not. Okay, I figured as much. Um, thank you all. Thank you to my guest, Jason Mansukis. This was uh, especially fun for me. I'm not always a fan of my guests. What? That's weird. <laughs> um, I booked them myself, and yet sometimes my arm is twisted. Um, I'm going to start with the thank yous with uh, David, our intern, David Mandel, who, again, uh, I think built the pyramids. Uh, in a previous life. I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. This kid's unbelievable. Jamie, Sammy, Kenny, right here inside the studio. Out there you've got the, the three J's of joy. Justin, Josh, and Jason. Angie Johnson, rounding out the final J in this here ball team, sitting in for Samantha Ward, who may or may not return to these here <laughs> Studio space. Is she ever coming back from Israel? Yes. yes. She's on birthright. They won't let you live there. And she did other travel. Like, she went over there and did other traveling. She's gone for like three I love weeks. how defensive both of you are to her. Well, I, well, I like well, her. We love Samantha. <laughs> yes, we do. We, we all love Angie Jewish. Johnson. We love Samantha. <laughs> she sounds aggressively Jewish. I'll yeah. be honest with you. <laughs> I didn't know she was Jewish. That's how non aggressively yeah. she is in. Uh, it's only, ha only I, a good She's half. a halfie. Yeah. She's a half. Ward. I, don't, I haven't met many Jews named Ward. Ward Steen. Pfft, I've had enough of the Ward Steens. And Wardowitz. The, and the Ward Bergs. And the Wardowitzes never cared for. Mm. Uh, Elaine Ewing, whose uh, brother Michael I saw again this last weekend in Seattle, doing our social media maving as always. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, all of you for joining us live here on the YouTube. Check us, uh, those of you getting us later on the Earwolf. Thanks and write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. David, you owe me an email. Let me know your shirt size for your Larry King victory. Send in yours to win your very own. Uh, I believe that is it. We will wrap this one up. Thank you uh, to, uh, to, uh, to our studio audience here. We had uh, I can't, the, no camera to cover them, but uh, there's uh, been 47 people in the studio the entire time. <laughs> Their presence was felt. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Look at that. There we go. Woo! Yeah, look at that. Yeah. It's all happening. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> you guys are on the internet. Nice. Oh, shit. Now we got to somebody print out three more releases. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time, and as always, get out of my face.